from the Online Ocean Symposium. This is the final leg of today's programming. We have had two other hangouts starting at noon in different portions of the globe discussing World Oceans Day uh, and the uh, preserving of our blue, uh, sorry, of the blue heart of our planet. I have to say it has been an awe-inspiring and amazing process. These conversations have been fantastic. And if you think that was something, just wait till you see this hangout. I want to get intru uh, started introducing our guests. So let's start with Louis. Hi, how's it going? Good, thank you. Welcome to the Hangout. So you are a filmmaker. You're the uh, founder of the OPS. Can you tell us a little bit about what work you've been doing, so to speak? Oh, boy. I mean, uh, the, the next film that we're working on is uh, is probably not one... Uh, I, would, I wouldn't describe this describe it this way if I was trying to sell it to you to go to the movie, but it's it's about mass extinction of species caused by mankind. Mm -hmm. um, it's really it's going to be a, a film. It's going to be a lot like the Avengers, but real. <laughs> so you know we want to take a dire subject and make it interesting, make it exciting. Want to get people to get on board to you know. So we're at, at LPS. We don't just make movies. We try to spark a movement. So, so it's uh, we're trying to make a. To, to start this movement, so people understand that we're going through a, a you know, the, it's the beginning of what they're calling the Anthropocene, the sixth ma mass extinction on the planet, and we want to we want to stop it. So the movie in question that you're talking about that you're currently working on is the Heist. That's working title, correct? It's the working title, yeah. So can you it's, describe uh, it a little bit? Uh, pardon? Can you describe it a little bit? Um, yeah, well, it's a, lo it's a lot like the Cove, where we have a unique team of activists that come together, uh, all of them with special skills, kind of like a like an Ocean's Eleven team or Avengers. You know, in this film, we have, uh, you know, the real life Iron Man, Elon Musk, who's uh, getting us a, a Tesla S car that we're going to use to as a getaway car. We don't want to tell you quite what we're using it for, but it's going to be it's going to be another eco thriller. It's going to be another uh, adventure. So we're using somebody like like. Uh, you know, right now we're acidifying the oceans at this incredible rate. Um, you know, we've been acidified about 30% since the industrial age. And the, what we need to do is get people to get off of fossil fuels. Um, and what better way to do it than to, you know, take the hottest car in the world and uh, use it as sort of a centerpiece, like a James Bond vehicle for our film. I don't want to tell you quite what we're doing it, but we're, what we're doing with it. But it's going to be like a, um, it's going to be a stealth mobile. <laughs> Well, I know that I definitely want to get in one of those uh, cars someday. But uh, you actually mentioned The Cove. Uh, your movie, The Cove, was not only hailed by critics ranging from you know, The Times, Rotten Tomatoes, to Roger Ebert, but actually won an Academy Award, right, for document best documentary? Yeah, it, uh, the, the, the Cove was actually the first documentary in history to sweep all the movie guilds. It won about, I don't know, over 70 major awards around the world from Sundance to the Academy Award. and. Um, we actually we made it right in this room. It's uh, my bedroom. <laughs> it, uh, I know I was just hoping to get it in the Sundance at some point, and then uh, that was sort of our goal. But then we we sort of overshot our mark a little bit. Um, you know, it, and the, the film has you know really gone on to uh, you know by some estimates that we're saving about ten thousand cetaceans a year because we reduced the demand for dolphin and porpoise meat by about sixty five percent since it came out. Wow. So I mean that that's the real that's the real measure of success for me. It's not it's not the awards. It's the it's the action that it created. Wow. Well, speaking of action, uh, you are also uh, involved with the Ocean Preservation Society. Can you speak a little bit to what that is? Uh, what, what is? Uh, yeah, that? it's a it's a nonprofit organization. We make films to inspire people to save the oceans. Um, and the the code was our first film and. Um, you know, I, I feel like we kind of knocked it out of the park for a first-time filmmaker. It's like, a, you know, it's like a rookie at the World Series. And now we want to step it up. Um, you know, the oceans, diving in the ocean is the single most beautiful thing I think I've ever done in my life besides create a family. Um, when I, you know, I, it's like, to me it's like space travel, to, to put your head under the water and see this beautiful universe. You don't have to go to Mars. You can just go right, you know, right to the ocean, put your head in the water. You see all these amazing things. We're seeing... The disappearance of the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life in my lifetime. Uh, you know, we're we're losing coral reefs. We're losing you know most of the the fish. Um, uh, but I think if I, if I have some hope in this whole thing, it's just that a film, a film can really inspire people to change. You have 90 minutes. 
90 minutes to to move their hearts and their minds and and get the it feels like the universe on the same page. Um, the the you know the cope. I don't know. I mean, we, this probably 30, 40 million people saw that film over over the you know the last four years. With the next film, we want to get a billion people on it, and so we have to make it. Uh, you know, we're trying to do something really big and audacious. Uh, the climax of our movie, we're trying to light up New York City. Um, Tony Malkin, who owns the Empire State Building, is allowing us to use the Empire State Building to do the world's largest projections. And on it, we'll put endangered species in the oceans that are, on, you know, hanging on by their fins. Um, but the idea is to, to light up, you know, if we can light up Manhattan, we can light up the whole planet, I think. You know, everybody in the world will know what's going on with the oceans. Uh, that's that's the mission for me is to try to how do you get people to understand and on the same page that we're losing the oceans at this incredible rate and then more than that inspire them to save it. Most definitely. Well, I hope that we all together can get this uh, big global broadcast and get world attention on saving our oceans. Uh, next up on our guests, I'd like to introduce Elena and uh, Paul. Uh, hey guys, how's it going? Going great, thanks. Welcome to the Caribbean. <laughs> We're doing Welcome great. To the hangout. <laughs> so, uh, you guys are involved with the Virgin Island, uh, sorry, Virgin Island Coral Reef Preservation Initiative. Can you speak a little bit as to what that is? Yes, I can. We, I actually am launching the Virgin Islands Coral Reef Preservation Initiative as a, as the outcome of my master's thesis. And I am, what I want to do is keep all the businesses, the local businesses that bring people out to coral reefs together and keep a network going through that initiative because they're so important to our community and they share the reefs with millions of tourists every day and locals. So I really want to con continue that momentum from my master's thesis. Uh, so that will be, that's in the works right now to be launched. And we are also hosting a film festival today uh, in honor of World Oceans Day here in on St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. That's fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about what the film festival, besides World Oceans Day, what is it bringing together, who's involved? Uh, Paul, can you actually talk to uh, your involvement with that? Yes. I, I would love to. Thank you. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks to uh, several of our uh, colleagues from around the world, we're able to provide a lot of uh, first-rate content for this film festival. People like Joe Romero and Bill Fisher from 330, 333 Productions, Jonathan Bird from the PBS series Jonathan Bird's Blue World has provided a, uh, a brand new film that uh, has not been seen yet anywhere else called Secrets of the Reef. We're delighted to have that. Our dear old friend and I believe a, a mutual friend of Sylvia's, uh, Leandro Blanco from Madrid, Spain has uh, allowed us to use The Beast is Dead. Yay! Yay. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, one of my films, and then one that Elena and I did uh, uh, together. Uh, so we have uh, seven pieces that we're going to screen this evening here in the Virgin Islands. We're very excited about it. Uh, there's been a, a really good response so far. Uh, we're about a, an hour and uh, 50 minutes away from uh, our launch here. So we'll, uh, we'll give you a full report at a later time. But we're expecting a very big crowd. Wow, that's uh, fantastic. Well, we'll be checking in, and we would love to get an update and post that through our social media. Uh, if there's any other links that you want to give, do let us know. And anybody watching at home, uh, do take a look at our various blogs, various feeds, various sites, and we will get you more information as well. So uh, good luck on your World Oceans Day event. Next up is a fantastic photographer who made a splash this last year when one of his images went viral. Welcome to the symposium, Octavio. Hey, Andrew. Hi, everybody. How are you? Not too shabby. So um, you took a one of the, as I was mentioning, one of the most popular ocean photos of 2012, blew up the internet, and we actually talked about it on one of our last hangouts with uh, Kip Evans. Can you speak to a little bit to David and Goliath as an example of uh, effective marine protection? Yeah, actually, that picture can be done in several years ago, not necessarily because we didn't have the technology, is because that place in particular was overfished around 20 years ago. And this place is a small town in the Baja California Peninsula, it's called Cabo Pumo. And it's a town of fishermen that had a lot of tradition uh, linked with 
fisheries in the in the ocean first they exploited pearl oysters and then they exploited sharks and another species from the ocean and at the end they overfish the reefs or their reefs in front of of the their town so 20 years ago almost 20 years ago they decided to close the area they decided to leave their nets and since then nobody has been extracting anything from that place and that is the reason why uh, now we can take this kind of images in a place like that um, David and Goliath is uh, the diver in the picture is one of the sons of uh, of a dive master that was part of the implementation of the park. The, his name is David, and the fishes that you see in the pictures it's uh, it's a group of jacks that were in reproduction during during the season of reproduction, and this kind of behavior is what. It, it used to be the behavior of in many other areas. Um, it's a behavior that the fish needs to to do in order to mate and and generate new lives, and it's part of their courtship. So um, uh, this is the beauty of Cabo Pumo. This is uh, Cabo Pumo is now an experiment because we are seeing a lot of things that in many other places we we cannot anymore. Well, uh, from what I understand, Cabo Pulmo is actually a, uh, a one of Sylvia Earle's hope spots. Yes, uh, this is part of um, a large uh, region that this initiative that Sylvia is leading. Um, it's uh, Cabo Pumo is part of the Gulf of California region or hub spot. And I think Cabo Pumo could be a great example of what we can do in other parts of the Gulf of California and in the rest of the world if we really, really commit with the protection of the oceans. Um, Cabo Pumo has 18 years without, uh, without any extractive activities. And in a very, very few short time, uh, Cabo Pumo has recovered all this spectacular marine life. And um, I think it's an example that can be followed by other coastal communities. And again, it's an experiment for scientists and for filmmakers and for photographers, because we can take these spectacular images of, of the wonderful marine life. Excellent. Well, um, you're not just a photographer, you also are a uh, research scientist at Scripps uh, Institute of uh, Oceanography. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I, I'm coordinating a, a research program that is called the Gulf of California Marine Program, and we work with several uh, initiatives. We study the importance of coastal habitats for as a nursery for many species, especially commercial species. We also work with marine reserves. We, we do a lot of studies about marine reserves and Cabo Pumo is one of our uh, most important um, um, areas of study areas. But also we work a lot with fisheries. We are trying to understand the uh, fishing patterns of uh, the fleets in the Gulf of California and we are trying to give more information for decision make makers to apply a better management strategies to ab avoid overfishing of, of the species. So the Gulf of California Marine Program is, is growing and it's been uh, working now for more than 15 years and it's part of the, my, my jobs here at Scripps as a scientist. Well, that's a fantastic job, and keep up the good work. That's really excellent uh, and fantastic work to be doing. Sorry, to be doing, especially speaking on uh, World Oceans Day. Uh, speaking of World Oceans Day, I'd like to throw it over to Molly Malloy from One World One Ocean. Hey, welcome back. Hi, Andrew. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great to again. Great to have you back. So this year, and I believe last year, or this has been a multiple thing. Ocean. Uh, One World One Ocean has been running a video contest for World Oceans Day. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and the history of that? Yes, absolutely. 
So for many of us who may not be familiar with One World, One Ocean, we were started by um, a film company, McGillivray Freeman Films, um, which is the largest independent producer of IMAX films in the world. So our whole platform is built on uh, the belief that media um, has the power to really change people's attitudes and behaviors. And, you know, Louis spoke to this earlier. We really believe that film can be a key tool in helping people protect the ocean. And that's not just our films, but the media of other people. And really getting the youth engaged because youth are just so critical to helping solve this issue. Sylvia speaks about this all the time. Uh, so the contest is really engaging youth to tell us uh, what they think the ocean means to them, why they think it's important, and using film as the way to do that. So we challenge them to make minute-long videos um, about what the ocean means to them. And we've gotten some amazing entries, everything from, I think last year's winner was a rap song, uh, mm -hmm. to this year's winner, which um, will be announced today, but I'm not going to tell you because you should log on and look at them, but they're fantastic. And you just really see the creativities of these kids, and it gives us personally a lot of hope and uh, reinforces what we're doing as well on the uh, IMAX level. Fantastic. So a winner has not been announced yet. Uh, when will when will that be happening? Today. Ooh. World Oceans Day. Is there still is there still time to vote on who you'd like to? Voting is closed, unfortunately. But I hope that everyone did have a chance to vote, and you can you can see all the entries on OneWorldOneOcean.com as well as our YouTube channel. Fantastic. So, uh, what areas has One World One Ocean and Mac Free Film focused on in the past year in regards to the ocean and uh, ocean conservation and ocean movies? Right. Well, last year was really, for us, focused completely on the Arctic with the release of our IMAX film to the Arctic, which came out last April on Earth Day. And that was a film that was all about the changing Arctic landscape, told through the eyes of one polar bear, bear family. Um, it was narrated by Meryl Streep. Uh, Sylvia opened the film in the most, you know, powerful quote um, of all time. It was just really amazing. And that film... Uh, debuted to theaters around around the world and was the highest grossing IMAX film of last year. And through the film, we were able to activate with all of our nonprofit partners to really focus on the Arctic. So beyond the film, there was online videos, uh, photo slideshows, and all this communication online as well. Um, and it was just a really amazing film. And we actually did a survey of people who saw it. And, you know, 60% of people said they wanted to learn more about the Arctic after seeing the film. Uh, and 80% of people said it would change the way they would vote about environmental issues in the future. So really seeing that link between the film and changing people's behaviors. This year for us, we're really excited re starting today. Um, this year is really about all the South Pacific for us. Our next film on the ocean comes out in January of next year. Um, I can't tell you the title, but it will be announced very, very soon along with our trailer, which will be released this summer. And really showcasing the marine biodiversity of Raja Ampat, Indonesia. I'm sure there's many people in this hangout who have dove there before, but it's one of the most spectacular, some say the most spectac spectacular diving spot in the world. Um, it's just a beautiful story about a 12-year-old boy who goes on an incredible journey through these islands for two months on this traveling learning classroom by boat called the Kalabia, just learning uh, about all the biodiversity of his own marine backyard. And it's a really special film and certainly showcases the importance of marine protected areas, um, which I know we all are firm believers in here. So well, it's, uh, it's that an like exciting an awesome, film. That sounds like an awesome project, and I can't wait to actually see it. So keep us informed, and we will be checking out all of your different feeds to make sure that we keep on the ball on that. So. Right. Thank you very much, and also congratulations to whoever will be the winner of your awesome contest. So now I'm going to throw it over to uh, Dr. Chris, Chris Tech, who is calling in from uh, Costa Rica from the Sea Turtle Restoration Project. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Welcome to the symposium. Going really good. Happy World Ocean Day to you and all the guests and all the people out there. Uh, I'm here in Costa Rica, just wrapped up week one of a two-week expedition, and uh, happy to say things went really well, and I was diving down in the ocean yesterday. Fantastic. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the Sea Turtle Restoration Project? What do you guys do? What uh, is involved? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Sea Turtle Restoration Project is a nonprofit mm -hmm. advocacy group. We're part of the Turtle Island Restoration Network based in the West Coast in California. And uh, we work around the world to preserve sea turtles and their endangered populations, having successes for over 20 years. Uh, the Turtle Island Restoration Network overall 
we work to protect uh, endangered salmon, inform uh, public health advocacy on the um, poisonous seafood that's contaminated with mercury, uh, to work to protect enda endangered salmon with our project, the Salmon Protection and Watershed Network. But the Sea Turtle Restoration Project at seaturtles.org is our oldest and most successful project. Well, that's really great to hear that you're working on so many different aspects and also hyper-focusing on sea turtles. Um, what are you doing in Costa Rica? Can you uh, speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. Um, I'm here with our project partners, um, Project AWARE, which is a scuba diving conservation organization, and with uh, Pretoma, a Costa Rica-based sea turtle and ocean conservation group. And together, the three of us have combined efforts to launch a new project to bring uh, beach cleanups and research on the issue of plastic pollution in the ocean to the dozens of sea turtle camps that are here in Costa Rica patrolling beaches around the country every day. It's an effort that is really exciting, really easy, really low cost, and I really want to thank our project funders, Project AWARE, we were able to print um, these metal signs, like I put up in the background here. I'm pointing to it right now. And uh, they are in Spanish telling communities that uh, plastic pollution harms all marine life, that fish and sea turtles mistake little pieces of plastic for their food. And our little leatherback is telling everybody, help maintain clean beaches. Well, that's actually some excellent, excellent work. Um, the the fact of the matter is there was a bit of recent tragic news that came out of Costa Rica, specifically around sea turtle conservation. Can you speak a little to that? Yes. Uh, about 15 miles from where I was working last week, um, last Thursday night, a young conservation worker with a history of being uh, on the leading edge and, and really challenging the uh, powerful poachers near his city on Moing Beach was found murdered. Uh, it's a tragic event that's had shockwaves across not only uh, the sea turtle conservation community, but throughout the entire country. Uh, Jairo Mora Sandoval was 26 years old. He's left um, his parents with, without their son, and the Sea Turtle Conservation Project with a new fear that uh, the poachers in that area are using deadly force. We've started quite a few actions in response to this. We have on our website, seaturtles.org, a petition to the president of Costa Rica demanding swift justice. We've partnered with over 10 different environmental nonprofits from around the world to provide a fund to give $10,000 for the reward for any information leading to the capture and conviction of the killers of Iro. That fund is growing by the day, as well as our partners, and we also have a fund that's primarily through uh, individual online donations at our website, seaturtles.org, to support his family, which are in a time of need right now. Well, keep up the great work, and hopefully we can get some uh, action on there and get some answers. And hopefully conservationists in the future don't have to fear for their lives when they're trying to protect such a worthy animal as a sea turtle. Now, uh, next on our Hangout, I'd like to introduce Nancy Knowlton from uh, the Smithsonian. Welcome to the symposium, Nancy. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, greetings, uh, not exactly from the Smithsonian right now, but from the coast of Maine, which is very inspirational on uh, World Ocean Day. Most definitely. So, amongst other responsibilities, you run the Smithsonian Ocean Portal. What is the Ocean Portal, and uh, what does the Smithsonian do surrounding the ocean? Well, the Ocean Portal itself is a website. Uh, the idea is to present uh, information and images and both inform and inspire people around the world. Uh, and it's not, just, it's not just ocean science. It's uh, also arts, uh, film, uh, books. Uh, and then in the science realm, everything from basic understanding of biodiversity and sea level rise and, and hurricanes um, and ocean acidification to what people can do to help save the ocean. It's not just, a, it's not just Smithsonian material. The whole idea is to bring the best uh, material from anywhere. In fact, if you, any of you who are watching have some ideas about things we should feature on the ocean portal, track me down on Google and uh, we'll try to put it up. 
Well, I'm sure we can definitely think of a few ideas and get make some good connections there. Uh, so what work are uh, you doing on preserving and maintaining ocean areas and ocean experiences? Well, the, there are two things that I'm personally involved in. One is the launching of a, a new global uh, effort by the Smithsonian with partners to try to keep track of what's actually happening in terms of biodiversity. And uh, its, its formal name is the Tenenbaum Marine Observatory Network. We call it Marine Geo for short. And what we'll be doing is uh, keeping track of changes in ocean diversity around the world, including, I hope, Sylvia, and some of your hope spots where we hope to see the, the numbers go up rather than down. Um, which actually brings me to another thing that I've been working on, which is this whole idea of, of focusing not just on the bad things. I think we all need to know about the bad things. I certainly am, like some of you on this panel, I'm old enough to have seen a lot of bad things happen. Um, during the course of my career, but I started a project called um, Beyond the Obituaries where I really try to focus on some of the good things that are happening. Uh, in fact, we, uh, Octavio's uh, Cabo Pomo story was one of the first things we identified as something we wanted to feature. And the idea here is to uh, tell people that um, you actually can make a difference and that it's not all hopeless. And uh, there's, a great, there's a great African motto that says if you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito, which I think is very <laughs> apt to uh, marine conservation. That's a really poignant way of putting it. Um, so what <laughs> excites you about the ocean? Uh, can you speak a little bit to that? What excites me? I'm quite sorry, I couldn't quite hear yeah, you. Yeah, what excites you about the ocean? Well, you know, you go underwater and it's, a, it's this beautiful, awe-inspiring world with all these crazy creatures, some of them stranger than fiction, you couldn't make them up. Uh, uh, if you tried, but there they are, uh, making a living in the salt water. And of course, it's uh, you know it's seventy percent. It's not just seventy percent of the surface; about ninety-five percent of the real estate on the planet. So, it, it really is planet ocean, not planet Earth. And uh, I just I, I grew up uh, wandering around beaches on Long Island Sound, and now the whole blue planet is my beach, I guess you could say. And I, I like every part of it. That's fantastic. Well, we will definitely be keeping up with uh, the. Ocean Portal and the work that you're doing, and we'll again try to make those connections to get some uh, different suggestions from our audience and people on this panel. Uh, now I have the great honor of welcoming back Dr. Sylvia Earle, her deepness. Welcome back to the symposium and happy World Oceans Day. Happy World Oceans Day, right back to you <laughs> and well, everybody who's listening. Fantastic. As you know, in each of these hangouts, uh, the panels have been covering special portions of the ocean, like your hope spots. Can you tell us a little bit about these hope spots? What do they signify, and how do they come about? Well, actually, for me, there's just one big blue hope spot. It's called the ocean, of course. Mm -hmm. But there are special areas within the ocean that really shine in the sense that if we can and will take measures to, to change the way we're behaving, there's hope that they will be better than they presently are. It's certainly true in the Gulf of California, and <laughs> Cabo Pomo is a shining example of what can be done to turn things around. It's not on the current list of places that are marked in blue, but Chesapeake Bay is a big hope spot for my standpoint because we can make things better. We'll never go back to the way it was when Captain John Smith was there 400 years ago, but we can make it better than it is in 2013 by taking action. The Gulf of Mexico is another area, and all of the Caribbean, and, well, as I say, all of the ocean. We can do better than we presently are. Well, here's hoping that we can most definitely bring together all this focus and attention on World Oceans Day to get this big movement going. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Mission Blue and what uh, that is and what they have been working towards? Mission Blue really got underway as a consequence of receiving the 2009 TED Prize. And that gave me an opportunity to make a wish big enough to change the world. It launched during the same week that the ocean and Google Earth launched. It was quite a week, <laughs> February 2009. So not only can the world look at Google Earth and with new eyes and actually dive into the ocean, but because of the wish that the Tedsters granted me to 
come up with an idea big enough to change the world. It was to ignite public support for changing the way we think about the ocean, to support protection of the ocean with a network of hope spots, protected areas large enough to restore and protect the blue heart of the planet, the ocean. And here we are, you know, four years later, Mission Blue is now a foundation. We've worked closely with the National Geographic for this, but we have partners that, dozens of partners actually. The, the idea is to be a catalyst to help empower those who are doing a good job to get the word out. Uh, like mm -hmm. what Louis Sohoyas is doing, like when One World, One Ocean is doing, like what the National Geographic is doing, the conservation organizations such as Conservation International, the Audubon Society, uh, World Wildlife Fund, you know, NRDC. There are literally dozens of individual entities out there, all thinking blue one way or the other. And Mission Blue wants to be common ground, to empower them, to celebrate them, to work with them, to cause people to be not just aware, but to care and take action that will really restore health to the ocean and therefore really important for us. The ocean drives the way the world works, keeps us alive. We have to return the favor. Most definitely. We definitely have to take care of our blue world. And hopefully today on World Oceans Day, we can bring together all this momentum and uh, keep that movement alive. I've been asking this of various people all over the place, and I can't help myself since I have you right here. What is one of your favorite spots in the blue ocean? I know that the entirety of the ocean is your favorite hope spot, but what is one of the favorite spots that you have to dive, to experience, to return with nature? Well, I'll tell you, it's almost any place 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. oh, I know, it's a terrible answer, but it's true. There's been more change in the ocean since I was a kid than during all preceding history. At the same time, we've learned more about the ocean than during all preceding history. And the pace is picking up. One thing that really needs attention is the deep sea. The deep sea. Most of what we know, most of what we focus on, even in this Google Hangout, is the illuminated upper portion where divers can go. But we need submarines. We need remotely operated systems. We need to get ourselves either vicariously or with submarines personally into all parts of the ocean. You can't care if you don't know. And where I'm sitting right now, DOER Marine Operations, the vision for developing systems to gain access to the sea. It's an entity that I started that my daughter and son-in-law are now owning own and operate, but soon there will be a 6,500 meter system on a vessel that will be operating in support of ocean exploration and research, an operation called Ocean Science Service. We need lots more of this sort of activity. Hey, I love it that James Cameron, about a year ago, made a descent back to <laughs> where Don Walsh and Jacques Picard went in 1960 to the deepest place of the ocean. It's only seven miles. It's only seven miles. Think how many people have been seven miles up. Only yeah. three people have been seven miles down. This is ridiculous. This is the 21st century. We've been to the moon. We're sending probes to Mars and way out beyond our own solar system. What about this part of the solar system? Most definitely. You know, you actually mentioned ROVs and the need to go down to the bottom of the ocean, and I was wondering if, uh, just to kind of change the conversation a little bit, since we are now at the halfway mark, and I can open it up more for the discussion, how many of you had seen the most recent articles about the ROVs, remote-operated vehicles, that went down to the bottom of the Monterey Canyon and actually found all this trash down there? Did, did anybody else see that? Oh, I've seen it personally. You know, this, when I say diving almost anywhere 50 years ago is like the dive of my life, <laughs> because in, everywhere I go now, I see trash. Even when I go down thousands of feet beneath the surface, 
there's trash. There's evidence that humans exist on this planet. It wasn't there, much of it, when I began diving. Mm. Octavio, can you speak a little bit to this? What have you seen out there? So you're currently muted. If you could unmute yourself in the upper right-hand corner. Sorry. Fine. Totally fine. I, I also had the fortune of, of using a submersible to go up to 400 meters in the Sea of Cortez. And we found evidence as well of trash, beer cans, plastics, nets. It's, it's um, everywhere we have now. This, this trash evidence. So this actually brings up a uh, back to the work that Chris you've been doing in Costa Rica with the trash pickups that you've been working over there. Can you speak a little bit to what you've been seeing out there? Right well right now we're seeing litter from all over the world on beaches where sea turtles nest and scientific studies have shown that this can be a direct threat to the baby sea turtles as they try to reach the ocean. It's also a direct threat to the nesting females as they come up if they get caught in discarded nets that are lying on the beach that can be a fatal move. Um, but yeah, the folks don't recognize that all these plastic items that are made for five minutes of use last for hundreds of years in the environment. The studies that are conducted don't take place at the bottom of the ocean where the time for degradation is even longer. It could be that they never go away. The plastics primarily float, but there's a good one-third that don't float. And those are going to be at the bottom of our submarine canyons, flowing, as all things do, down through gravity to the bottom of the ocean. And part of that ecosystem, which we are just now on the tip of an iceberg understanding. So. You know, it's something that every one of us in our lives can do to connect to ocean conservation is reduce the amount of disposable plastic in our lives. Um, while it's not easy to get down to Costa Rica for most people and join a sea turtle conservation project, it's really easy to take small steps in your life to reduce plastic and then clean up your local ecosystem. Most definitely. Louis, I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit of the um, uh, of the way to impact people and bring attention to issues like this through film, through the work that you've been doing? Well, absolutely. Oh, sorry, uh, Chris, uh, Chris, I was throwing it to Louis. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, you, you have to get people emotional. That's the only way to really move the needle um, with, with, it, with people. You can give them all the information you want that's helpful, but the to get them to change, you have to get you have to pull their heartstrings, and um, you know that's what we're trying to do with the next film. Uh, we're also trying to make people realize that you know there's a a million things you can do every day to save the oceans. Just you know your decision on what you eat has a, a tremendous impact. Um, I you know just uh, you know, since I started making this film, I've you know I've stopped eating fish. I should have done it a long time ago, but. Uh, you know, the average bite of food in America comes from 1,500 miles away. Now, the consequences of that is that you put, you know, you put a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. With the next film, we actually have a, a film, we have a camera, a specially built camera, it's a uh, infrared camera. It's the same technology that we use to get into the cold, cold, to get past the guards, the guard dogs. What we've adapted is so we can actually see carbon dioxide with it. And so we take this camera, we, we drive around LA, we go around to Colorado, you know, places in Colorado, and you can see uh, the carbon dioxide coming out of the cars. You can see the carbon dioxide coming out of the chimneys. You can see carbon dioxide coming out of all the other. We, we actually adapted so you can see methane. So there's 19,000 fracked whales in the county next door to me. You get to see the, um, the methane coming out of it. So, so the this, this sort of boogeyman that you can't see, uh, we make scene. And so people have a visceral action. I hope when they come out of the theater and they turn on their car, they realize that they're traveling on the highway. There's 12,000 explosions going on in their car as they're hurling down to, you know, to get, get back home every minute. Um, once you can make this visceral, you can make them feel it, then I think people start to make these decisions. And they start to say, well, you know what? Uh, an electric car and getting onto solar is, is a damn good idea. Um, you know, right now, you know, my, my house here, my, my operation, it's, uh, it's 140% powered by solar. I'm, I'm speaking to you on a solar-powered uh, 
you know, computer. My car is solar powered. The, the license plate says VUS, it stands for Vehicle Using Sun. It's the opposite of an SUV. We want to we want to get people to realize that the that the energy that we're using is killing the oceans. And that uh, the alternatives are actually all upgrades. I get checks from the having 140 percent of the energy uh, produced by my uh, the solar panels on the roof means that I get checks from the electric company. They pay me every month to produce my excess electricity. It's a, this is an upgrade, folks. It's not like you have to go bundle up and you know freeze in a corner if you're a, if you're an activist. Most definitely. Well, we have to find ways of making uh, an impact both viscerally and economically to try and get a more impact with the conservation aspects and the different energy aspects. Uh, I was wondering if Elena and uh, Paul, you can talk a little bit about interacting with people and displaying a message and part of the purpose of the film festival that you're working on is to try and spread these different messages. Can you speak a little bit to that? be delighted to. Thank you. Um, surprisingly, as we're in a community surrounded by water, there is a there is a surprising lack of understanding about the water and the oceans and the seas and and what they what they provide and and what is it at stake here. Uh, that of course is the the cornerstone of of uh, our reasons behind uh, sponsoring this film festival tonight and and everything else that we do. I might point out that I'm I'm one of uh, Sylvia's producers for Ocean in Google Earth, or should I say, uh, Google Ocean, and uh, also. Uh, Yay! <laughs> and uh, also for uh, uh, Mission Blue on occasion, and I'm very proud to do that. One of the things that we're going to screen tonight uh, is a very recent added uh, addition to Google Ocean about uh, the uh, the psychedelic life of corals, and huh. it's about uh, coral fluorescence. And it just went live last week or the week before, and we'll be screening that. It's uh, it, it's through. Initiatives such as those and community outreach that we try to to get to people who just don't know yet, I, and I feel that through a conduit like this, we will hopefully see a new generation of people who know, and if they know, they have a better chance of caring, and they have a better chance of, of uh, giving our oceans uh, a little bit more to work with, and, and to hopefully uh, reverse some of the damaging trends that we've been seeing over the past couple of generations. Well, it's excellent work that you're uh, getting up to, and do let us know where we could either buy a copy or get a preview or check out at least some of the awesome footage of the iridescent coral. That sounds really fantastic. Um, Molly, uh, act sorry. Oh well, it's it's on Google Ocean right now. Uh, oh. It's in it's in the uh, the area. You can find the little uh, locator pearl right off of Little Cayman. All right. Well, we will definitely. Uh, I'll be spreading out the message of how to find that through our different streams. Uh, awesome, Molly, thank you. Molly, I wanted to speak to what One World, One Ocean is doing in bringing together uh, the world specifically on ocean issues and bringing attention to all that, uh, both through the work that, again, One World, One Ocean is doing and Mac 3 Films with the 360, uh, or sorry, uh, the immersive uh, video footage that you guys are doing with uh, the ocean. Uh, sure. Sorry, Andrew, you broke off there at the end. I missed the end of your question. So can you speak to some of the work that uh, One World, One Ocean and Mac Free Films is doing to bring attention to these, uh, not just the horrible issues that are facing our oceans, but even the beauty just to inspire activity and getting out there? Absolutely. So, um, you know, really following up on Nancy saying it's, it's more powerful to inspire people who may not be in love with the ocean as much as we, we are through the, the positive stories. And... The IMAX platform uh, to us is really the most immersive, transformative, cinematic platform to be able to do that. I mean, you have screens that are eight stories tall, and you, we are able to take people to these places in the ocean, and it's as close as some people are going to get to ever being there. So seeing a humpback whale's mouth on a giant screen or a soaring aerial over the South Pacific Ocean, and if you're a five-year-old or a 10-year-old going on a school field trip, that's a moment in that theater that can truly change you. And so that's, that's really where we see and are focusing our, a lot of our efforts. And of course, all the other amazing tools like YouTube and social media, whether Twitter or Facebook, those are just other platforms where we can reinforce that message. So uh, really, again, looking at the film that we have coming out in January, we actually just screened for our company the first cut on Monday. 
and that was on you know a small screen it's just going to be incredibly powerful and there's some moments in there showing people this sea life that they've never seen before that I think will truly make people take a step back and say wow I, I want to get involved in this effort and I think that's the other thing that we're doing is we work with the, our partners like Mission Blue and all these amazing partners here to reinforce the beauty of the film with ways that people can get involved. So the film is the first step, but then it's following up with avenues where people can create that change through wonderful organizations who are the boots on the ground uh, with all these different sorts of programs. Fantastic. Um, now I'm going to throw it back to Nancy. I wanted to speak to the Smithsonian specifically because the Smithsonian is a is an institution that contains numerous different museums, numerous different zoos and exhibits, and different aspects that bring together uh, both the public educational aspects, professional scientists aspects, and tries. Uh, and has been trying from its inception to inspire and educate. And I was wondering if you could speak to the educational side of inspiring uh, ocean activism and conservation. Uh, don't forget that you are currently muted. Sorry. There you go. Um, so right from the very beginning, the sort of the motto of the Smithsonian is to increase and diffuse knowledge. So diffuse knowledge means you know getting you know one thing to to learn something, it's another thing to make to allow other people to learn what you've learned. So um, we do, uh, the Smithsonian is plays a huge role in what is often called informal education. So we don't teach courses and uh, you know give lectures as much as we do uh, inform and inspire people who walk through our doors or come to our websites. I mean, we have a, a beautiful exhibit on the ocean at the Natural History Museum, which actually we're just are renovating now to uh, strengthen the conservation messaging from when it was first opened a couple of years ago. So about five million people walk through the Ocean Hall every single year. And that, that's a lot of people. And uh, of course on the web you have the potential to reach even more people than that and create uh, communities of people that are, it's, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that's really changed with respect to just um, informal education in general, museums in particular, the people, you want to get away from a model where, you know, the big Smithsonian is telling you, you know, passing on received wisdom and rather is engaging in a conversation. And so increasingly we're trying to figure out ways to have um, what we do with the ocean be a conversation between the Smithsonian and, our, and the people that visit us rather than, you know, just us putting material out. So that's where the web really comes in. Um, this whole idea of talking about beyond the obituaries, the idea is to create a platform where people can actually share their success stories and, and talk about them uh, on the website rather than just have them being there as static uh, entities. Touch, you touch on a very important point and that's about uh, turning it from a lecture into a cons uh, conservation conversation. Uh, because when you actually have a conservation conversation with the public, it turns it into a dialogue of back and forth where people are being educated in the process. Now, this actually touches upon some of the uh, questions that we talked about in some of our last hangouts surrounding World Oceans Day. Specifically, why uh, is there a need for a 24-hour focus on, a, on the ocean? Why is there a need for a World Oceans Day? Uh, Sylvia, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Why do we need to have a specific day to have international focus on the ocean? We need a 365 day a year focus on the ocean. I mean, it's nice to have 24 hours where you really amp it up, but taking care of the ocean should be front and center every single day for all of us. This is what I think of as the sweet spot in time, that what we now know that we could not understand when I was a kid, or even 20 years ago, now, because of the technologies that take us up in the sky and observe the, the loss of polar ice, the way of measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the way to look at the records of how many fish there were, and how many fish there currently are. The way of assessing plankton in the ocean and see how it is diminishing, follow those trends that we now know that we did not know, we didn't know, we could not know 
not long ago and project it on into the future, the next 10 years, the next 20, the next 50, the next 100 or this is that sweet spot when for the first time we really understand our lives depend on nature and most of nature is blue. We think of it as green but no, no blue, no green. We have to take care of the water and water is not just H2O. Water is alive. Whether it's fresh water or the ocean, it's filled with life. It generates oxygen, takes up carbon dioxide, shapes the chemistry of the planet, makes our lives possible. You know, if you think that nature doesn't matter, just strip off all of the life and you've got a planet that's a lot like Mars. Mm -hmm. Well, we're making Earth a lot more like Mars than it was when I was a kid. And our job now at this critical, pivotal, sweet spot in time, when as never before we know what we know as never again, when we have a chance to take action that will get us what we strive for, a, an enduring place for humankind within the natural systems that keep us alive. Most definitely. It's uh, really great that we need to, that, that we can come together and have this hyper focus in this sweet spot of time. And that was actually something that most of the people agreed upon in most of the other conversations was that there needs to be daily focus on the ocean. But it is rather significant that there is a UN recognized day specifically for the ocean to try and draw in people who are focusing on their day-to-day -day jobs, on how are they going to get their next food, on what's happening on The Celebrity Apprentice, uh, to focus just for one day on the impact on nature and the ocean. And Chris, I'd love to hear, as one who is out in the field currently, what, why is there a, a World Oceans Day? Why is there a need for this focus on the ocean for at least one day? Well, you know, I got to give it back to Sylvia Earle. You know, her book inspired me when I was just 16. We need a sea change. You know, we need 365 days. You know, I'm really proud to be one of the co-authors on a bill we passed in California last year to name October 15th Pacific Leatherback Conservation Day in our state. So it's going to raise awareness, you know, but the popular media, the photographs, the videos, the IMAX movies, you know, we need every single tool in our toolkit. We need to be pulling them out every day and, and working on this problem. And we need to keep working together, doing the policy advocacy like we do at the Sea Turtle Restoration Project, the communication and outreach. But, you know, one day on the ocean will hopefully inspire people to take a little bit of extra effort, get down to the beach, feel that pulse, the heartbeat of the planet. Um, that happens every day. Um, whatever it takes for, for everybody out there, you know, to make that extra effort. I know that the eco tour we did to the sea turtle uh, beaches, seeing the leatherbacks nesting and holding the hatchlings before releasing them, uh, it changed the lives of a dozen people that I was with. And uh, we hope that World Ocean Day can change the lives of everybody that, that takes a moment to think about what we're trying to do and to take action. I really like that, the heartbeat of the world. That's fantastic. I've never heard that phrase before, and I really love it. Uh, Octavio, I'd love to uh, throw it to you. What are your thoughts on World Oceans Day? Why is there a need for a UN-recognized international day of 24 recognition for the ocean? Well, I think, um, again, there are very few days where we remind us that 97% of this planet is, is ocean. So, I mean, I think uh, we need more people engaged with these activities uh, about the oceans. We need an army of photographers, storytellers that uh, spread all these stories that uh, Nancy, Sylvia are, are saying. We need to um, share all these successful stories because there are thousands of people including us, that we want um, a healthy ocean. And I think I applaud the efforts to push the individual efforts, like, for example, uh, tell everybody that don't consume a lot of plastic or don't use a lot of plastic or change their habits, especially in, in, 
with the food that we eat, but also we need to, I think, we need to put more efforts in trying to convince the governments and the corporations that we need to make a huge changes. We need to uh, try to uh, interact more with the owners of the corporations because at the end they are humans and they will suffer like everybody else. And we need to make more efforts to push governments to apply more um, strict regulations to, to have healthy environments. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree that we need to remind different corporations and government entities that they, in the long run, are stakeholders in the future of the ocean. And as long as we can get that uh, message resonating with them and resonating with the larger world, uh, we can take the 24-hour period of World Oceans Day and extend it throughout the 365 days. Um, Molly, what are your thoughts on World Oceans Day? Why is there a need for a 24-hour period? Sure. I think, you know, the importance is twofold. It's one, what everyone has said here, it's really using this day to get the oceans on the national agenda in a way that is hard to every other day, um, if we were trying to do it every other day, given everything else going on, and really inspire consumers, uh, uh, make this a priority for the government and other key stakeholders. But I think another really important part of it, too, is, I mean, at least for me, and I think I'd speak for one role in ocean, it's such a great opportunity for all of us as partners and people who care about these issues to come together and get inspired. I mean, so much, so many of the times we can get bogged down um, in sort of that tunnel vision and what we're doing, but today is a day where we can all take a step back and uh, sort of get that energy back and get excited about, you know, all of our priorities and programs and events for the year. I think you are in mute, yes? We can't Sorry. hear you. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, for some reason, it muted me. Uh, anyway, I wanted to throw it back over to Elena and Paul. Uh, but again, thank you, Molly, for what you just spoke to. Most definitely needs to uh, have these different. Uh, Elena and Paul, you are using World Oceans Day to have your film festival and bring attention onto this film festival. Can you speak a little bit to that? About the film festival? That about, we're need for a, about World Oceans Day and why that's significant. Uh, the, the reason that we chose this day is, of course, it, it's a day that's kind of where the, hopefully the world focus is on the oceans, and we're uh, utilizing that, that kind of groundswell to help raise awareness and get some people involved and, and get them over here to, uh, uh, to the beach tonight to see the films and, and know what's at stake, as I said earlier. We're very excited to host this tonight. It's uh, we want to make this our this is our first annual film festival here, and we plan on bringing this back every year to St. Thomas on World Oceans Day, and we're planning on submissions and really building up an audience here, uh, in the Virgin Islands and throughout the Caribbean. We really believe that film is powerful, very powerful, and we want to share the underwater world with those that don't necessarily go into the water, uh, and the best way to do that we think is through this film festival, and we want to continue on with the momentum forward in the years ahead. We're very excited about this and, you know, very happy to bring our local community together tonight. Well, I'm very excited for you as well, and I hope that Thank this you. is a huge splash and that for years to come it just keeps on getting a larger ocean swell. Um, yeah. <laughs> why, from uh, the perspective of the Smithsonian and from your experience, why is there a need for a 24-hour period of ocean recognition? Uh, well, I, I feel that, uh, you know, we're th kind of throwing a giant global birthday party for the ocean, human beings are. And, you know, everybody needs a birthday to celebrate and to have uh, the attention put on it. But it doesn't mean, for example, you know, if it's your birthday uh, today, but it doesn't mean we're going to be mean to you all the rest of the days. So we have to <laughs> we think, we think about you and, and celebrate you on all days. We just focus on you on your birthday. So. I feel like World Ocean Day is, is the ocean's birthday, and we celebrate it, but then we keep on uh, honoring it and celebrating it um, the 364 other days of the year as well. I really like that idea as well. Ocean uh, World Ocean's Day is the ocean's birthday. That's fantastic. I'm going to go make a cake in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> 
Lee, what, uh, what about what about you? Why is there a need for a two, uh, 24 hour period of recognition for the ocean? Well, you, you look at what Earth Day did for the environmental movement. You know, I guess that's my hope is that uh, World's Oceans Day sort of sparks a, a movement that goes way beyond obviously just a day, but you know, uh, you know, we're trying to create stewards for for a lifetime. Um, so that's the mission, really, is to to blow this up so it becomes a an international event that people that inspires people to save the oceans forever, not just one day a year. That goes back to kind of what Sylvia was speaking of and what has been re resonating throughout these entire talks is that really, while it is great that we have this World Oceans Day and as you mentioned, Earth Day, really every day should be World Oceans Day, every day should be Earth Day, every day we should be thinking about how our actions and activities impact you know, the blue heart of our world and beyond. So right now we are slightly over time and I wanted to give everybody a chance just to give their final thoughts on this talk and on World Oceans Day before saying farewell for the rest of the day and enjoying the rest of our World Oceans Day. So I wanted to, you know, really quickly throw it back to you, Louis, since I had you speak last. Any final thoughts for this hangout? Uh, yeah, I guess for the people listening out there, I mean, if you want to save the oceans, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, uh, stop eating fish. You know, um, think, think about a plant-based diet that's uh, it's less carbon intensive. That carbon won't be going into the atmosphere, won't be absorbed by the oceans. Um, get on a plant-based diet if you want to save the planet. Most definitely. Uh, watching our eating habits and eating smarter is definitely a way to go with that. Chris, what are your final thoughts for the Hangout? Well, every one of us is a walking, talking bag of salt water. We are the ocean. <laughs> every day is World Ocean Day. Get out there and get plastic out of yourself and out of the ocean. Man, that that was really fantastic. Octavio, final thoughts? Well, let's um, talk more about oceans. Let's talk about uh, more communities that are living in the coastal areas, communities that uh, interact every day with the oceans, and the majority of them, they want healthy environments, so let's help them communicate in that, that uh, messages. That is a really great sentiment as well. Every day is ocean. Nancy, what are your final thoughts for the Hangout? Uh, it's World Ocean Day. There's one ocean, and as was mentioned before, our, our blood and our tears are salty. We're all part of it. We're all connected. Uh, we share the fate of the ocean. We all share a common fate with our ocean and with each other. Paul and Elena, what about you guys? Final thoughts? Uh, I think my final thought for today is to inspire people to get in the water. <laughs> I think it really changes everything. It's inspiring and it's healthy and we want to encourage that through our films today. And that would be all of us living in the Virgin Islands every day as much as we can to get in the water. And if you can't get in the water, if you can't get in the water, uh, go online, go to uh, Mission Blue, go to Google Earth, uh, Google Ocean rather, and, uh, and see what's down there. If you're not a diver, you can go underwater with us, through us. Uh, it, it, obviously, this needs to be part of the continuing international conversation, and uh, we're, that's why we're all seizing this day to try to bring that into global focus here and, uh, and around the world. Things are going on, and we're delighted to be part of that. Elena and I uh, collaborated on a film called The Fine Line, and the closing uh, comment there that in the titles is celebrate World Ocean Day, and then uh, two seconds later, up comes every day. <laughs> Again, that's totally resonating with what we're all talking about, and just to speak on that, I know that all these different conversations have at least made me want to go jump in the water, so at some point in the near future, I'm going to try and organize a dive trip with everybody on all of the hangouts. That would be awesome. So, <laughs> next up, Molly, any final thoughts? Elena and Paul totally stole mine. I'm so mad. I was going to say for people to go get in the water and just to dive in, whether that's, you know, in real life, going surfing, stand-up paddling, going on a scuba dive today, or like they said, dive into all this amazing multimedia. And I'm totally biased, but if you're going to watch one thing, you should watch Sylvia Earle's TED Talk today because it's, it's all you need to know. 
Most definitely. That TED Talk definitely inspired me. And I know that the next uh, person I'm going to throw it to is definitely going to tell us that we need to get into the ocean and get into the water. Sylvia, can you tell us what your final thoughts are for this Hangout? Well, I'll underscore with an exclamation point everything that's been said by the others participating in this Hangout. But here's one, my final thought, that there's plenty of reason for hope when you consider that there is an ocean day that's getting traction, that people are beginning to care, that nations around the world are embracing their blue backyard. Australia has declared one third of its exclusive economic zone for protection. Bermuda is looking at like a blue halo of protection around their, their island. Uh, look at Kiribati and the Cook Islands, and all over the world, the Bahamas, are beginning to sit up and take notice and take action. Now, there's a lot left to do. You know, there are only about, well, a fraction of 1% of the ocean is safe for fish and other ocean wildlife. But the, it's moving toward that goal of 20% of the ocean by 2020. It's, it's increasing now, and we have a Secretary of State, John Kerry, in this country, who really cares about the ocean. Plenty of reason for hope. Never before have we known what we know about the importance of the ocean. Never again will we have an opportunity to do what's now possible, to make a difference for the ocean and therefore for our future. Most definitely. Those are some really inspiring words. And I hope we can all take those words and move forward and bring together a World Oceans Day that spreads throughout the 365 days of the year. I want to thank each and every one of our participants today for joining me today for our World Oceans Day Hangout. It means quite a deal to me that you guys took a portion of your World Oceans Day and spent it with me online to speak with our audience. Thank you to our audience for joining us. And for those watching at home, let's not wait for a special day to celebrate for our oceans. Let's make every day World Oceans Day. Let's keep up the hope, and let's get out there in the ocean. So thanks again, and see you in our next Hangouts. Thanks for organizing it. Thanks, Andrew.